what are the best settings for this monitor? And by best settings, I mean the settings which I adopted in the review, and you can find a link to that, as well as information about how you can support the work that we do in the description of the video. So it satisfied my usual colorimetric targets, which I go for in my reviews, and it suited my preferences. Individual units do vary, and so do individual preferences. So these are just a suggestion. Don't expect them to be optimal in all cases. In system setup, there is a power setting, which should be set to standard mode. It should prompt you to do this when you first use the monitor, but if not, just make sure, just double check it's set to standard mode, otherwise it's gonna lock some settings off. It's gonna limit the functionality of the monitor and also limit the brightness potential. Another important setting, and this one is gonna come down to personal preferences and what you really want from the image, and that's display color space. If you set it to wide gamut, then you're gonna get a vivid and saturated look to things, but you're technically getting oversaturation for SDR content, which is designed with the sRGB color space in mind. The DCI P3 setting as explored in the review is a bit of an odd one because it slightly restricts the color gamut, even though the color gamut already sits very close to DCI P3 by default, and you don't really want to restrict that any further. It makes a few other image balance changes as well. So there might be some use case for that, but generally I'd recommend either wide gamut or sRGB. With the sRGB setting, you're gonna to tone things down. You're gonna get more accurate output within the sRGB color space which is what most content is designed for under SDR. You'll be aware from my reviews, I do like to explore the monitor using the full gamut, but also sRGB, which I explore separately. So for my test settings, I did technically use the wide gamut setting, and that's what I'm gonna keep it at for now. I also changed the color temperature, color temp to user, and set red to 100, green to 95, blue to 95. So 100, 95, 95 for RGB, respectively. This got close to 6,500K on my unit with a well-balanced green channel. Remember, again, inter-unit variation does play a role here. Something else I noticed on my unit is if I changed the color temperature setting, then the display color space setting reverted to wide gamut. So it's slightly annoying because you have to do things in a certain order, but just remember that in case it applies on your unit as well. So if you set the color temperature setting first and then the display color space second, that should work fine. Another important consideration is the game visual preset. I'd recommend either sticking to racing mode, which is the default, or user mode, which can be set up in exactly the same way. I kind of use them interchangeably, although I said I used racing mode for my test settings in the review. It doesn't really matter as long as you set things up in the same way. Quite a few of the other presets will add additional filters. And in the case of the sRGB Cal mode, that's basically, well, in my unit, it was less well calibrated than just using the sRGB color space setting, and it also restricts various settings. So I don't really see a good use case for that. It may be better calibrated on your unit versus the alternative, but I think for most people, the flexibility with the settings is gonna be more important and the calibration should either be similar, if not better, actually just using the color space setting instead. But yeah, if you set this to something other than user mode or racing mode, it will apply additional filters and make other changes, which you can't actually counteract in the OSD in some cases. For example, it might mess up the saturation and crush shades together despite the fact that the saturation sliders seem to be set to the correct neutral positions. And mobile mode, for example, kind of just makes specific shades stand out, others not so much. If this is useful for you, then fair enough. And I'll also come back to the FPS mode because that does have some use cases as well. But yes, the general recommendation, user mode or racing mode. I set the brightness to 58, which got me close to my usual 160 nit target on my unit, and uniform brightness was enabled. If you disable uniform brightness, you can get some higher brightness peaks, but your brightness is gonna go all over the place, a bit like you're using a dynamic contrast setting on an LCD. So it basically will use an aggressive ABL automatic brightness limiter. So when you're on the desktop in particular, you will notice these fluctuations in brightness depending on how much bright shade is being displayed on the screen. So generally, the more bright content's being displayed, the dimmer the display will get overall. Whereas with uniform brightness enabled, it'll give you a much more consistent experience, which many will prefer. And everything else under SDR was kept at default. So yeah, I set the monitor to 240 hertz in Windows. That isn't a specific setting on the monitor, but it is worth just paying attention to. I used either user mode or racing mode. Changed the brightness to 58. Color temperature was set to wide gamut by default, so I didn't actually change that. And I made some adjustments to the color channels. Another thing to pay attention to is the variable refresh rate status of the monitor. If you want to use VRR, then just make sure that's enabled as it is here. If you want to use ELNB, which is quite niche on this monitor really, it's a BFI, black frame insertion mode, then you do have to disable variable refresh rate and also have the monitor running at 120 hertz. 
I'm now going to enable HDR and consider the HDR setup of the monitor. You can use variable refresh rate at the same time as HDR on this monitor, that isn't an issue. In HDR setting, there's a little toggle, adjustable HDR. I'd recommend enabling that. If you want to use the full brightness capability of the monitor, you'll have to enable that. And then set the brightness to 100. That will allow you to achieve the maximum HDR brightness capability, otherwise you'll be limited to a peak brightness of around 800 nits maximum. Unlike on the XG27AQDMG I tested, there weren't clear changes to saturation or for darker shade representation when using 100 versus 90, with 90 being the default setting without adjustable HDR active, at least outside of the true black 400 setting, which I will come back to shortly. You can lower the brightness further if you need to for viewing comfort reasons. You can go as low as 80 without really dragging down the whole image, but below 80 you'll start to create a dull and unbalanced image. So again, my preference is to set this all the way up to 100. If you prefer a more consistent HDR experience with lower brightness peaks, you might like to use the Display HDR 400 True Black setting. This does use an entirely different calibration, which is why it will turn off the screen and then it'll take a little while to turn itself back on again, or it'll appear to be doing that, if you toggle between this and another HDR setting. And if you're going to be using this, then just keep the brightness at the default of 80 or disable adjustable HDR, which will do the same thing. If you set the brightness above 80 in this mode, and that would include 90, not all the way up to 100 necessarily, then the experience is biased more towards higher brightness at the expense of EOTF tracking or overall brightness calibration accuracy, and it falls more in line with the console HDR setting on my unit. So I'm going to look at the remaining HDR modes now, so these are very important to consider, the HDR settings. I'm just going to switch over to console HDR now, and I will be keeping brightness at 100. When observing the Windows HDR calibration tool as I am now, or a similar in-game HDR calibration slider, the default setting, which is console HDR, as I'm using right now, appears to be calibrated to a target white luminance of a little over 400 nits on my unit, even with brightness set to 100 in the OSD. This significantly limits the potential brightness output for bright shades. So I can show you this on the video even. That's set to around 400 nits, and it's telling me that that's the target it's supposed to be set to. And this will significantly limit the potential luminance output for bright shades. If you drag the calibration slider up, so either here, or using a similar in-game slider, to improve the luminance output of the screen, which it will do, it will significantly crush your highlight details. I should note as well, there's possible inter-unit variation going on. This could just be how my unit happens to be set up. I'm not sure exactly why they would do this, but I have noticed this on ASUS monitors in the past. Sometimes people notice these settings being a bit different and other people seem to have them very similar on their unit to each other. I don't know exactly why. Switching over to Cinema HDR, you'll see, you can now see the pattern again. Even though I've got the slider set to 1000 nits, I can get this all the way up to about 1600 nits on my unit, which exceeds the actual capability of the screen. Switching over to Gaming HDR, it'll become difficult to see on the video. It's a very, very slight visibility here. So it appears to be calibrated to around 1300 nits, which better matches the hardware capability of the monitor. In practice, Cinema HDR and Game HDR weren't dramatically different, but some very bright shades were slightly brighter using Game HDR, and I preferred the overall representation of that. So that's what I stuck to, though again I'd stress that there could be some inter-unit firmware revision variation and other variation in how these settings are calibrated. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider now, but in the game under HDR. So this is an HDR game environment, in other words. So with adjustable HDR active, it's not just the brightness you can set, so remember I've got the brightness set to 100 and I'm using Gaming HDR, which was the best calibrated on my unit. You can also change the saturation levels if you want to, so there's a simple saturation slider. As you increase this, especially with big adjustments, you will be crushing shades together and you will be losing shade variety, but you'll be oversaturating things. Things can look really quite funky. I know some people like this boosted up just a little bit, and you're free to do that if you want. Alternatively, you might prefer a less saturated representation, in which case you can reduce this lower than 50. You could have things completely grayscale if you really wanted to. And you also get six axis saturation adjustment if you want finer control over red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow saturation levels. I'm not sure why I almost whispered the word levels there, but never mind. My preference is to leave all of this at the default of 50. You don't have to worry about display colour space, that's greyed out under HDR, and it doesn't matter what you set it to under SDR. It's not a consideration under HDR either way. You can change the colour temperature setting as well. 
but be aware that significant adjustments here will limit the potential brightness output of the display. I was happy to leave this at the default 6500K. Another thing to be aware of though, is that the color temperature setting is actually carried over from SDR into HDR. So when I'm using my test settings, I have the color temperature set to user with the adjustments I showed you before. Whilst that was correct under SDR, under HDR, that actually gave me a color temperature of around 6,700K, which is a little bit on the cool side. It's not terrible, so you shouldn't expect a huge difference between SDR and HDR in this respect. Instead of fiddling around with the color temperature settings and changing them for SDR and HDR all the time when you switch between them, you might just want to use the same settings you were using under SDR. So whilst I was fairly vanilla in my approach, in terms of leaving most things set to the default under gaming HDR, except for using the adjustable HDR setting and setting brightness to 100. As I said, you can change various other things with adjustable HDR active, but you can't change shadow boost and there's no gamma setting or anything like that. So there's really no way to boost up the shadow detail, which I know some people like to do under HDR. You really just got to play around with the different HDR modes for that. It'll make slight adjustments depending on the mode you're using. But remember that they will change the calibration elsewhere if it's set up like it is on my unit, or potentially you won't notice much difference to the dark shades either way. So it's really just things like brightness and saturation that you can control. Most people should be fine with the default calibration, but it would have been nice to have at least some control over perhaps the black equalizer, gamma or similar adjustment just for people who like that kind of thing. I'm now going to have a quick look at the OLED care settings and this is something which is important to take a look at, especially that screensaver setting which is enabled by default. Probably can't really see this in the video. Maybe a little bit. Probably notice a difference in brightness when I've got this enabled versus disabled. But basically it will give you a vignetting effect. It will dim the corners of the screen in particular and the edges a bit more generally. It's the kind of setting which LG, who actually makes the WLED panel on this one, calls CPC, Convex Power Control. And honestly, visually it's kind of annoying, so I would recommend generally leaving Screensaver disabled. I also kind of wish they wouldn't call it Screensaver because it makes it sound like it's super important or it's going to act like the kind of screensaver you might have on your PC, and it's really neither of those things. There's a pixel cleaning setting. You can run this cycle manually if you wish, but you don't have to. It will run automatically when it's needed. You can also set a pixel cleaning reminder, which will just give you a message on the screen if you've been using the monitor cumulatively for this length of time without the cycle being run. When I said it runs automatically, it actually gives you a little thing, OLED usage info, which is really useful because it will just give you some reassurance that it has been running the cycle. So, so it says the total time that you've had the monitor on for, the number of times the pixel cleaning cycle has been run, and the pixel clean interval, which is how long after it has last run the cycle for you. And it will run the cycle if it needs to. I think it's after eight hours of cumulative use it'll do this or try to do this. It will just do that in the background when you're not using the monitor. So it'll do that when it goes into standby. So that's if it's lost a signal to the system. So for example, if Windows Power Management has sent the screen to sleep, or if you've shut your system down and the monitor isn't receiving a signal anymore. Alternatively, if you press the power button of the monitor to sort of turn it off in that way, then it can also run the cycle. Something to be aware of, if you're using proximity sensor, which is a setting I quite like actually, just in case it interrupts the review where I'm sitting a bit further back than I usually would because of the camera, I had this disabled, but it usually just have it set to middle and it works quite well. So when you leave the monitor in a few minutes, the screen will go blank. So that's a nice sort of conservation measure, but it doesn't actually set the monitor into standby. So it's not going to be running its pixel cleaning cycle just because the proximity sensor setting has decided to blank the screen out. So it's a separate thing. There's also a screen move setting. It's set to strong by default and I found this absolutely fine. I didn't find it bothersome, so I just left it there. If you do find it bothersome, you can tone it down to middle or perhaps light or even turn it off if you really need to. I mean, none of these image retention mitigation measures are going to give you 100% proof from burn-in. Depends on how you use the monitor. That's really going to be your main determining factor there. But it can help reduce the chance of this or increase the time before you can expect issues of that type. There's also auto logo brightness. You might like to just leave this on. If you don't really notice it doing much, then that's fine. Just leave it on. And what it will do is it will dim static elements of the screen a bit, or smaller static elements, I should say. So although it says logo brightness, it doesn't, it doesn't just affect logos specifically. It'll be buttons and various other static elements. And that can include when you're playing games, watching movies, or when you're on the desktop. So just for consistency in the review, I had this disabled. You might have even noticed a bit of a brightening up there. So it takes a little while for it to actually dim down and it's not a super obvious dimming down. 
but it does have an effect and it is generally a little bit brighter with it disabled but as with the other settings just enable it see how you find it if it annoys you don't use it and don't lose sleep over that I'm on Legom, legom.nl, the website. I'm going to talk a bit about visibility enhancement on the monitor, which you might want to use for a competitive edge. So by default, these are my test settings. I did mention in the review that the gamma tracking at the low end is a little bit beyond the 2.2 target, and that means that some dark shades are a little bit too blended together. You can't see this accurately in the video, by the way, but it'll give you an idea of the relative change some of the settings I'm going to go through will make. So if you want to boost the visibility, there isn't really a way to do that to purely correct the gamma curve and not upset things elsewhere, but there are certainly some settings you can use to boost the visibility anyway, if that's your main concern. So in gaming, there's a shadow boost setting, quite a mild boost if you set that to one, a bit stronger set to two, a bit stronger set to three, but the thing is that the top row, so the darkest shades, they're not actually boosted up so much. It's more the kind of medium dark shades that this boosts up. So it's not necessarily going to be helpful. I mean, it can be helpful, but it isn't necessarily going to make your darkest shades any brighter and improve visibility there. At least it doesn't touch the black depth, so it doesn't upset your contrast. And it doesn't touch your brighter shades either, so it is quite selective, which is nice. And there's AI Shadow Boost, which is quite a bit stronger, and that does actually give a bit of a boost to the darkest shades, which is nice. It doesn't affect the black depth or the contrast. But this is supposed to look at the image and make changes based on the image. So the changes it makes depends on the image, which is why they called it AI, I guess. So you'll see an AI assistant, as they've called it. So they've got AI settings. I mean, it's not, they're not really AI settings. There's nothing AI about this, really. They're just the usual kind of settings you'll find on many gaming monitors. But there is a toggle anyway for AI Shadow Boost there, so you can easily toggle it on and off. Another thing you could do is change the gamma setting, lower the gamma setting in colour. So 1.8 will give you the biggest uplift again, it doesn't make these darker shades super bright or super revealed, so to speak. However, you could combine that with AI Shadow Boost for an even greater effect. But even then, the first two shades there, they're not visible at all. I mean, they are slightly visible, but they're really not as visible as you might want if you're trying to boost up the image. You could change game visual to FPS mode, and that gives you the biggest boost, bigger than any boost I showed you just before with all of those settings active. And you can even set AI Shadow Boost to on with FPS mode for an even greater boost. And then set Gamma to 1.8 for an absolutely ridiculous mega boost. But when you've done all of this, and even just with the FPS mode in general, it really gives a very funky, oversaturated image. And again, if it's really just for a competitive edge and you're playing a game where you specifically want to win, and that's sort of the main thing you're focused on, then by all means use this setting. You might find it useful. But if you're trying to just have a generally well-balanced image, but with an uplift to dark shades, that isn't really what you're getting here.